I'm Adam Penning and these are my top tips for successful winter carp fishing. Well, you join us down here at Hintlesham Fisheries, tucked away in darkest, remotest Suffolk. It's a little day ticket place that I come to. It's not too far from my home and it's usually good for a bite or two. Now, I should temper that with the fact that we've just descended into winter proper this week. And last couple of nights have been the coldest nights of the winter so far. We're less than a month from Christmas now. Most of the leaves have come down, which is given us this amazing crisp vibrant carpet but it's really on the change now the water temperature is well down into single figures and we've had some heavy frosts and, and this morning it was when I drove here it was it was teeming down with, with very very cold rain and it was three degrees so we probably weren't that far off getting a bit of sleety snow nonetheless we've uh, we've all fished in weather colder than this and more brutal than this and come away with fish so we're not going to be disheartened the thing to, to, again, temper that with is the fact that whenever you get the first really cold snap of the year, it does tend to knock the fish in quite heavily on the head. And that can, you know, I've seen that chub fishing, pretty much any species, but carp do tend to get blighted by that more than most other freshwater species. So you do often find that on most lakes after that first week of um, of, of everything slowing right down that the carp sport will pick up again once it's stabilized after a week or two but as I said those first few days when it drops which is what we've got right now can be a bit of kiss of a kiss of death but you know we've come to a lake that has got plenty of carp in it you know there's lots of fish in here we're on a lake called specimen 2 there's quite a few lovely scaly 20 pounders in here what we are going to look at while we've got the rods out, or I'll tell you about why I've got the rods, where I've got them and what I'm doing. Again, um, we'll get into that a bit later, but we're going to be looking fundamentally at the key things that I would say I place most importance on for successful winter carp fishing. The first one is that, and, and you'll find as you get older, you'll feel it more and more, is obviously the cold and dealing with that. Now, when I think back to my sort of younger years, there wasn't really an awful lot of, you put three pairs of socks inside a welly boot. Not really great for keeping your feet warm. In fact, welly boots are awful. But nowadays with modern tech and the fact that carp fishing has borrowed a lot from other outdoor pursuits, climbing and so on and so forth and, and um, taken those things into our winter clothing. And now I think really there's no excuse for being cold on the bank because as soon as you do get cold, you get miserable. You start thinking of the fire in the pub or whatever, and you just want to go. And obviously, once you're at that point, you're very unlikely to catch a fish. So we want to be here in a comfortable situation for as long as we need to be. So going from foot to head, good waterproof boots are very, very, very important, vital. Uh, mine are from, a, I think they're an American brand called Lower very very good insulated um, boots they're designed for walking long distance hiking and so on but they're well insulated very very waterproof and um, they protect me from everything even if I had a dip in the edge you know they're waterproof up to the ankle and beyond so that coupled with underlayers absolutely important thermal underlayers I can't overstate enough how important they are so underneath this I've got the long john set top and bottom uh, set then I've got a pair of joggers and then I've got masala pets. Now, for me, the barometer on winter carp fishing is when the masala pets come out. Today is the first day that I've needed them some, since, well, we had a cold old spring, didn't we? So probably since May, but once I get the masala pets on, I feel absolutely bulletproof. They're waterproof, they're thickly insulated. It's like wearing a sleeping bag. And of course it goes all the way up to your armpits because they are masala pets, so much better than just trousers. A good coat 
this is actually my, my sort of all season coat. It's not my thickest coat, but it is waterproof. It's pretty thick. Um, it, it does the job on a day like today. If I was out for a couple of days, I've got a thicker, more heavy, durable one in, in the van, which I would get out, but this is fine for what I'm doing now. This is a real top tip called a snood or a snood. Keeping yourself warm around the neck and under the chin makes a massive, massive difference. There's loads on the market. I've had this for a long time now. It's got a, a fleecy, micro fleece lining, lining, really thick. You find that if you're moving around the lake or packing up or moving your gear or anything, the first thing you want to do is take the snood off. It really helps the heat build up and it retains it and traps it, which is exactly what you want. I tend to put mine on once I've got my gear to the swim, which is a bit of a tip in itself. If you've got a long wheelbarrow push to where you're going to fish or a long walk, don't put all your gear on there and then. Do it when you get to the swim because you will just get hot and sweaty and damp and dampness is the enemy of, of, uh, of an angler that wants to stay warm. You've got to be dry. So the snood, massive big deal. Now this morning it was teeming down with rain. So I've got a big bald head and it tends to get cold but at the same time I wear glasses for the fishing so a peak is very very important because I hate my glasses getting covered in rain but the skies have cleared now the rain's gone so the first thing that I will do is ditch that cold wax cotton hat which is great for rainy weather and get on to my cold bonds a really thick woolly hat like that what a difference that makes again especially if you ain't got any hair <laughs> but it will keep you warm anyway. A big, thick hat, absolutely imperative. So from toe to top, they are the key things that you want to be looking at for winter clothing. One of the key things that we learned a long, long time ago was the value of a really, really solid rod setup and a tight clutch. Now, this is part of my top most successful winter tips, but of course it applies to fishing throughout the angling calendar. Particularly at this time of year though, you don't want to be losing anything because bites are a lot fewer. But again, as I say, it's relevant to all carp fishing practices. We found, or my very good friend Colin Davidson found a long time ago that having a very, very secure backrest system in conjunction with a tight-ish bait runner stroke clutch, the hook holds and fish bites to banked ratio massively increased. And you went from maybe losing three fish out of 10 just to random hook pulls to having a 100% bite to landed ratio. So the premise is that from the get-go as soon as you get a bite the fish needs to be under control and firmly hooked and you achieve that by making it work for every inch of line that it wants to take off your reel before you get to the rod when you hear people having those screaming takes and the lines ripping off the spool and the spools are blur it's not really good angling that fish is making a lot of distance between the angler and the rod and the further it goes the more likely it is that it's going to run into trouble. It could be weed, could be snags, anything like that, other people's lines if it's a busy lake. So you need the fish under control from the get-go and working for any line that it's going to take from you. I always imagine that I want the fish to be like a, a dog on a, a lead or on a choke chain where it's straining to take any line off you. That's how it should be. So to achieve that, I like to have my bobbin on a drop of a few inches underneath the alarm, the sensitivity on the bite alarm, which in this case is the XDX radar, needs to be set as high as you can get it without having those annoying false bleeps from the wind. The point is that when that bobbin hits the rod, that, that's your period for bite indication. Once it's hit the rod, you're only gonna get a few bleeps because by that point, the spool should be turning slowly as the fish is working to take line from you, not spinning furiously as the fish is making it 50 yards up the lake away from you. So a bite should be up to the top like that. And then look at the spool. It should be just slowly clicking out line like that. 
If you fish like that, I can guarantee you that you will land more fish. One of those could be the biggest fish that you've ever caught. Over the period of the angling calendar or one season, you will have more fish to your name than if you fish maybe with your rod butts balanced on the ground and a slack clutch. Get a good secure backrest, solid setup, fish your clutch tight so that you can just about pull line off and away you go. I promise you it make a big difference to your conversion ratios. choice of bait for winter fishing is of course absolutely paramount you cannot cut any corners with bait in my opinion at any time of year but it's so vitally pertinent in the cold water months just always think about bait in terms of if the fish isn't willing to open his mouth you are catching nothing it's as simple as that so when I see people compromise on their angling by reducing or restricting the potential quality of their bait it is the biggest false economy that you can have in your angling you cannot cut corners and if you do it will be to your ultimate detriment i used to go without various things in the past maybe a new bivy maybe a new sleeping bag whatever it was so that i could afford the bait um, and whether it's maggots or whether it's the best quality boiler you can afford then that's where you need to be at so I think probably since the late 90s, my winter fishing has been all about these guys. Maggots play a massive part in my winter carp fishing almost everywhere I go, not quite everywhere. Obviously some rules might prohibit their usage and every now and again you do find a lake where the fish have a preference for boilies, but they're quite a small number, maybe two in ten, something like that. Generally speaking, everywhere I go, everywhere I've been, these play a big, big part. Now, maggots really have become de rigueur for a lot of winter carp fishermen for the last 10, 15 years or so. <laughs> but when we started using them and developing a maggot rig in the late 90s, it was so cutting edge that um, my, my long, long past, but very good friend, Kev Green, who was at the time working on angling times, came out with me to shoot a feature about this kind of fishing because back then it just wasn't done. Nowadays of course it, it's out there and it's a much more commonly used tactic but it's still as good now as it ever was. So what have I got here? It's um, a mixture of maggots, tiny pellets and boily crumb. Boily crumb in its own right is a phenomenal bait. I would say you know probably in my top two or three baits of all time is, is milled up boily crumb maybe with some liquids added to it you think how how attractive a boilie is what's the first thing you do you break it open and all those, those those that goodness comes out you know and when you get a kilo of them and you mill them up either uh in your wife's food process processor which gets me in a lot of trouble or uh in the garage using your own thing then um you create the ultimate carpet feed it's a big edge on lakes that have boily only rules because you can fish a ground bait situation and you're not breaking any rules. And I've used that to very, very good effect, particularly abroad on those French lakes that have boily only rules. Um, but getting away from that, boily crumb is, is absolutely a massive, massive attractor of carp. So I mix in the boily crumb with some little tiny 2.3 mil bloodworm pellets, very, very attractive in their own right. And of course the maggots and the whole lot is dampened down with cloudy manila liquid, which is um, a very, very sweet, it's almost like a, a vanilla Oreo milkshake. I mean, you put your finger in it, it's absolutely incredible. It gives a really soluble milky haze of attraction along the bottom, seeps out of the ground bait. And the key thing with that guys is, and I get a lot of messages about this, is when you're adding that liquid, plus the others that I've got in here, which are Bailey's Irish Cream, which is phenomenal, and a little bit of condensed milk. I tend to put the three components together in a saucepan and gently heat them until they're just thinned out enough to add to bait. The key thing is not to over add your liquids. If I put too much liquid into this ground bait, 
it will just become one huge stodge and it won't do anything on the lake bed. You want to keep stirring it with a spoon like this and working a bit in of the uh, liquid mix into the crumb at a time. If you go in too heavy, you'll oversaturate and it will become next to useless. After you've done that, add your maggots. Ratio isn't overly important, but maybe something like a, a kilo of crumb to two pints of maggot, something like that, you know, there's no rules. Now some lakes, they are in the minority, but there are some lakes out there where the carp do have a preference for straight boilies throughout the winter. Usually they are the older, bigger fish, but it is a trend that I'm seeing maybe slowly increasing. Certainly the, the winter that I've just fished on a, a big fish lake up in Northamptonshire, they wanted boilies um, through the winter. They wouldn't look at maggots. That is rare, but it's just to illustrate that you will find these trends. So always be aware of them. So when it comes to boilies, for cold water fishing, there is nothing better than something like the Manila Active, which is what I've got here. These are 12 millimeter Manila Actives. Now I like small boilies in the winter. Generally speaking, winter carp fishing is about small, whatever I'm using. So like the crumb and the tiny pellets and the maggots, or if it's boilies, just small little boilies like this. Now the secret with these is that they are coated in a quick breakdown paste wrap. And that is full of milks, sugars, proteins, betaines, things like that, all the ultimate carp goodness. When you drop these in water, you can see that they break down and you get this shroudy haze of attraction, this milky halo around each bait. And once they've been left in for half an hour or so, it's quite phenomenal the amount of leak off and attraction that you get. With something like the Manila Active, you don't want to be pimping your bait up, so to speak, yourself. You add liquids to these, you're just gonna get a mushy mess. These are already pimped to the max. So if you're into doing your own ones, just buy the standard ones and add your liquids to those. With these, they're good to go and I don't think they can be improved upon. And I'm sure you'll agree, when they're in water, they look absolutely incredible. There you go, my last bait tip good all year round, remarkably effective in the winter. You think that it's got all the attributes that a lot of baits try to have, which is it's small in size, it's very visible, and it's naturally sweet. The great thing about sweet corn is that it works in really, really small amounts. So I find that, you know, if certainly if you're fishing in the edge, literally a palm full on top of a, a rig, is, is ample, but you can obviously use it in the spawn if you're fishing further out. Some lakes respond well to big quantities of sweet corn. And if you're in the market for that, then get the kilo bags of frozen corn from somewhere like Sainsbury's or something, they're like a quid. So you couldn't have probably pound for pound the cheapest and most effective bait that's out there. You know, if you're looking for something that's real value for money, sweet corn is very, very hard to beat. On the hair, couple of grains of real maize, something like that. Maybe one grain of maize, one grain of plastic, something like that, if plastic is allowed. But um, never underestimate the power of the corn, particularly in cold water. Well, the day is winding up pretty fast. It's uh, getting dark and it's not even school pickup time yet. So we've had rods out for, I don't know, four or five hours now. Nothing has happened since we repositioned them apart from two liners. I'm sure they were in the right spot. And that was the location element was vindicated to some extent by one carp, which we did see, which came out several times repeatedly very unusual behavior, but it looked like a nice, happy carp right down in front of us, very close to where we're fishing. So we got it right. Um, it may well be that, as I said, you know, if we had fished into the dark this time of year, nocturnal hours are much, much more prolific. So 
if you are someone, I get a lot of social media messages about this, if you're someone that can only fish days, don't beat yourself up too much. It is, really is about the darkness at this time of year. So try and do those if you can. Hopefully you've enjoyed watching. We haven't managed a carp on this occasion, but that's real life, raw nuts and bolts carp fishing. So hopefully you've got some things you can take away, put into your own fishing, maximize your own success through the coming winter. And thanks for watching. We hope to see you again soon.